Time. All right, good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, so it's been a long week. We had uh, we had vacation Bible school every every night this past week and other things going on, trying to get some projects done in the house and just uh, a lot of a lot of different things. So uh, what I want to do this morning during this uh, Sunday school hour is um, continue with this discussion that we've been having uh, for the last three weeks related to uh, Codex Sinaiticus. Okay, so this will be the fourth. This will be the fourth time. I'm going to go again next next week probably on this, and then there's a flex week built into the schedule in July after Seth and Caleb each teach one week. Um, and then Nate starts teaching at the end of July that I might do a sixth one and just kind of kind of conclude some of the things that we've been talking about. But last Sunday, I want to kind of pick up where we were last time. Last Sunday, I had finished the hour by getting into some things related to the forensic evidence related to the codex. Okay, Remember, I, I continued to draw a timeline up here. We talked about a few different points. A few points that we didn't discuss in the past related to that timeline, and we ended by looking at um, some of the forensic evidence. And we started that, and if hopefully everything works, why I gave you this visual overview, okay? And what we did is we looked at the fact that the different sets of leaves, okay? So the ones over here on the left, these are the ones that are classified or described as being snow white. These were the 43 leaves that were taken for, by Tischendorf in 1844 to Germany and given to the King of Saxony as a gift and became known as Codex Frederico Augustanus. This is the coloration on the leaves that Tischendorf took in 1859 when he got the remaining portion of the Codex. So you can see from a, just, just forensically here, are they the same color? Okay. And so I talked about how different people describe the codex and describe it as being different colors. And the reason they're doing that is because they are, it's depending on what part of it they're looking at. Those that see the first 43 leaves that were taken to Germany in 1843, or excuse me, 1844, they see them and they're white. To this day, they are still that white color, okay? Whereas the rest of it has been darkened, okay? We looked at Simonides. Uh, testimony that when he saw the codex in the 1850s that it didn't it looked it had an older appearance that it should have had okay one thing I do need to clear up from last week is I mentioned to you two guys named Kalanikos okay one of them so this is this is a tale of two two Constantines two Kalanikoses and there's a lot of people with similar names so it can get confusing pretty fast right but there was a guy named Kalanigos who knew Simonides, was friends with Simonides, and, and he was in Alexandria, and he wrote the British newspapers in the 1860s to corroborate what Simonides was saying. He testifies to having seen someone, maybe even Tischendorf, darkening the codex. Okay? So this is just the forensic reality here. Okay? So then I showed you a couple other pictures. Uh, parchment color. So again, it's important for you to realize that the, these, these different pictures and so forth, these are <clears throat> based upon what still exists today. So if you notice in this sort of conglomerate photograph of the entire codex, you will notice that there are, there are leaves that are distinctly what? More white than the other ones, right? These are the 43 leaves that were first taken by Tischendorf to Germany in 1844. The rest of it is what is now in possession of the British Museum that was taken in 1859 to St. Petersburg, Russia. Okay? So, and then we also saw here just the difference. So these are contiguous pages, right? So this would be, if, if, you, were, if you had a book open, if you had a book open, this would be like facing pages on the same side, right? So one side of the page is this darker color, the other side is what? This whiter color. Just one second, Tom. And then you can see a few more photographs along those lines making that same point, yeah. So you may have said this and I may have missed it, but the, the white ones are the 43, the others are the darker. And then 
can are we to understand that at some point they've been recollated back together? They have only been recollated back together digitally on codexcyanaticus.org. The 43 leaves that were taken to Germany in 1844 are still in Germany. Okay, so they have only been assembled together through this project that was done by the British Museum online. Okay, another question I got during the week from uh, Mike Erspalmer was, well, what about, is there a different way to explain why those are this different color and in different, um, uh, so in other words, if these 43 leaves are taken to Germany and these 43 remain in Alexandria, remain in the desert sands of Sinai, okay, would that explain the different coloration? I'm going to say to you that I do not believe that it was. It would, because for the following reason: number one, one of the big stories you always hear about the reason why Codex Sinaiticus exists at all by those making the traditional argument that it's from the fourth century or from like three, from 325 to 350 AD is because it was in an arid, dry, desert climate, which meant the pages didn't what? Didn't deteriorate. Well, these pages are taken back where? Germany. To Germany into a more humid climate. And I don't know, they didn't have air conditioning in 1844. They didn't have any of that stuff. And so it, it doesn't make sense to me that the pages taken to the human climate of Germany would survive in a better condition than the ones that remained in, in, uh, in the sands of Egypt for an extra 15 or 16 years, okay? So you have, you have those forensic things, okay? And then we started, we started talking about the actual uh, codex itself. And this one I've got up here, um, this is an example, folks, of what I'm calling unnatural wear. You will notice that that particular page is at an almost exact cut at almost an exact right angle. Okay, same as on, same as on this side here. This is indicative not of natural wear and tear on a piece of parchment, but this is indicative of some blunt force trauma being enforced on the codex. So in other words, let me, let me show you that one and then let you compare one. So I'm going to go to choir uh, 10. Whoops. I'm going to go to choir 10, uh, folio 1. And, okay, maybe there isn't another one. I took notes on this stuff this morning. Hopefully the website will cooperate this time. It says it's doing something. Now, the point is, would you expect the nat would you expect naturally over time a thing to wear away at an exact at an exact right angle? No, it is indicative of somebody tampering with it. Okay, and apparently we are having problems again loading things. So that I will give it one second, and if it doesn't get better, we will have to move on. But I have I have lists here of things. Um, that can demonstrate all different types of all different types of issues uh, with the codex, just from a forensic standpoint. And remember that the inks, the pigments, the parchment has never been what it has never been. It has never been tested uh, via forensic evidence. Okay, so. I had here a list of other things to show you. I wanted to show you uh, unnatural wear versus natural wear. I wanted to show you uh, what appears to be um, unevenly faded ink on specific pages. I wanted to show you legitimate cases and examples of worm damage where the worms ate through uh, sections of the parchment at what would be considered to be a natural way. Remember last time I showed you that the scribe uh, altered the lines and spacing on the text to avoid a wormhole that was already in the parchment, okay? So I, I had down here to show you all these different examples and apparently we are still not going to cooperate. So I'm not going to wait for this thing to, uh, to come back to life. If it does and I have opportunity to show you those things, I will. Other than that, I'm going to move on, okay? So um, any, any questions about that? Unfortunately, I can't show you more because it's not not cooperating. If you, yeah. So the, the page that's got unnatural wear, what I couldn't divine from the picture what that was. What, what was the issue? The issue was. Hang on. Let's kill the page. No. 
The issue was that it was worn like this. So somebody had removed this, this section here in an almost exact right angle. And was there any significance to that chunk? Or what? Well, that, that's, that's up for debate, right? Because one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is Simonides claims that as he's doing the codex, he puts distinguishing features into it to signify that he wrote it. Things like acrostics and his initials and different things like this that appear to have been removed somehow from the codex. Okay, so those who are those who are being very uh, obviously uncharitable towards Tischendorf will will say that Tischendorf removed those things because he doesn't because they would give away the fact that Simonides was actually what the telling the truth. Okay, now let me just make a point about that while we're on that topic. While he is in Britain, he challenges Tischendorf to a debate. Simonides challenges Tischendorf to a debate, tells him to bring the Codex to England, have a public debate at Cambridge, and he will show the world that he is telling the truth. Tischendorf agree, initially agrees to this uh, meeting and then decides later on not to show up. Okay? And Tischendorf, or excuse me, Simonides talks about that. Okay, so let me see if I can get, this might be working now. Let me see if I can show you examples of faded ink. I'm going to go to Choir 36, Folio 1, Rectocide, rectocide. I'll exp explain what that means later. So you can see on this, I think, pretty clearly that the ink is what? Faded in spots. The ink is spot, the ink is faded in spots in an uneven way. Okay? Now this this could signify places where somebody was what? Right. Rubbing it or rubbing doing something to it to make to make the page to darken the page to make the page look what? older okay so there's all of these sorts of things uh, I showed you the example of candle wax one example of candle wax I, I want to show you one more where I think it's candle wax but there's some blemish in the page and the scribe this time interrupts an entire word go around it. to go around it that's the verso sign Okay, so I don't know while it's doing its thing. Did it do it? Um, so I want column two. So you can see right here. See this right here? These are the first two characters of a word. Then you have the blemish, and then you have the rest of the word on the other side. Okay, so what, what this forensic evidence suggests is that whoever did this did it on a parchment that already had these what? Blemishes. These different blemishes and so forth in it already, which is consistent with Simonides' story that he took an old, an old largely blank codex off the shelf and wrote in it the, uh, what wrote in it what ultimately became Codex Sinaiticus. Okay, so you have examples of wormholes, candle, what appear to be candle wax, water damage, uh, other worm damage, faded ink, natural versus unnatural wear. I do want to see if I could show you that this one that I tried to earlier, Tom, so you can get a better comparison of what I was uh, saying earlier. This is uh, folia. This is Choir Ten, Folia One Verso, and you can see the difference between a page that would have what we consider to be natural wear versus you, you see how this page is is definitely worn but it's it's worn in a way that would be consistent with something happening naturally over time versus this one here in choir 11 I'll just put it up here again since you asked about it folia 2 
Got to love when the technology is just Johnny on the spot. So while we're doing that, let me talk to you about this issue of choirs and folios, because this is going to be um, an important thing as we look at what I want to get into about Mark 16. So while you're waiting, I, and I have to give credit for what I'm about to do to uh, David W. Daniels of Czech Publication in a video he did on Sinaiticus, right? So this, this would be a sheet of paper, right? If you're going to make a book, you would take a sheet of paper and you would fold it in half. Okay? So this would be sheet one or folia one. Okay? And this is the, this is the recto side. This is the, so if somebody says, hold a book right side up, you would hold it like this. This is the right side. And then if you turn the page, this would be the verso side. Okay, and then this would be, this is all still the same sheet, right? But then this would be folia two, and this would be page one, page two, page three, page four, if you were turning it like a book, right? Okay, so you understand that basic concept, right? So when, when this website is talking about choirs and folia and recto and verso, this is, this is what it's talking about, right? Now, a choir, though. A choir, though, would be if you took four sheets and folded them in half. Okay, and then what would happen is your book would be made up of a bunch of different what? A bunch of different choirs that would then be sewn together and thus creating the codex or the book, right? So in this particular case, a choir with Codex Sinaiticus, a choir equals four sheets. Those sheets folded in half equal eight folia, which equals how many pages? 16 pages, right? So if, if, you just, if you just turn through here, you would see, I've got the pages numbered, you would see that you'd have one, you start with page one, and by the time you were done with this choir, you'd have how many pages? You'd have 16 pages, okay? Now, why is that important? Come with me if you would to go, if you have your Bible, open quick to Mark 16. Okay, Mark 16. Try to get my <clears throat> Mark chapter 16. Now I have a footnote at verse 9 in my Schofield Reference Bible, and I, I started this, uh, I mentioned this to you guys the very first lesson. This is how I started. I have a footnote in Mark 16, verse 9, that says, uh, The passage from verse 9 to the end is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts, the Sinaitic and the Vatican. And others have it with partial omissions and variations, but it is quoted by Arrhenius Hippolytus uh, in the second or third century. Right. So what that is, what that is essentially saying is the following. Okay. What two codices don't have Mark sixteen nine through twenty in them? Okay. So Vaticanus and Sinaiticus don't have Mark sixteen verses nine through twenty in them. Right. It does not matter that, all, that the remaining 600 Greek witnesses to the book of Mark all have those verses in them. Okay, So they're suggesting, based upon the authority of, of the Sinaitic Codex and the, the Codex of the Vatican, that those verses, those 12 verses, be removed or should not be where? In the, in the book of Mark. Okay, Is everybody with that? Okay. Now, i got to make some decisions here about how to, how to tackle this. Tischendorf claims, okay, that he observes what they call a cancel sheet. Now, I do got to get this to work because this is, uh, is going to be a big deal if I can't show you this. Okay, so I am going to go to Luke chapter 1. All right, so if you look at Luke chapter 1, this is the beginning of Luke 1. This is the end of Mark 16. Okay? You will notice that what do you see here? 
bunch of stuff erased. Well, I don't know if it's a rate. I think that's bleed through. But can you see that there is a that there's a big space that is at the, between the end of Mark and Codex Sinaiticus and the beginning of Luke? Is that atypical? What's that? That is not necessarily atypical. Okay. Now Tischendorf describes what he what he claims is a cancel sheet. Okay. So if I've got a choir here, like I just explained, right? He is saying that a scribe removed the sheet from the codex and reinserted a new sheet to cancel out to cancel out what was what was originally there okay now this argument is made based upon the fact that different handwriting and different color page that this that the, the coloration on the pages is slightly different and the handwriting is slightly different okay now the cancel sheet would it, the cancel sheet runs from Mark chapter 14 verse 54 through Luke chapter 1 verse 56 now why would that be because you have you're dealing with a choir right so and it's the it's the it's the middle page so that means that wherever wherever page 6 ends He's got to start the next page at the top, right, to make sure that, th that things aren't off in the choir, right? Well, the reverse is also true. He's got to make sure that wherever page 10 ends, that it doesn't mess up where page what? 11, 11 starts. So if I remove this sheet from the codex and I insert a new sheet, am I bound to fit in what I'm doing spatially between this page and this page so that everything else makes sense? Okay, is everybody, is everybody say, uh, understanding what I'm saying? Okay, so Tischendorf claims to have observed a cancel sheet here between Mark chapter 14, verse 54, and Luke chapter 1, verse 56. Okay, now I looked at this in great detail, and I'm just going to leave this picture up, number one, because we're having trouble, but number two, because you can check this stuff out on your own. If you want to look at these things, all you have to do is go up here to the reference choose what you want to look at and it'll pull up that page for you of the codex okay so you don't have to know what choir and fully and all that is to find what you're looking for you can just go chapter and verse and it'll pull it up right now is everybody with this okay hopefully you are so Sinaiticus as I said is made of a choir that are stitched together, and this is how they get a series of choirs that are stitched together to make up a codex. So if you are correcting something in the middle of the folia, or the middle of the choir, pages 7 through 10, you would just remove that sheet and then do what? Insert another one here, okay? So notice, this is folia page what? Something's not right. It didn't load what I wanted it to load, so I'm not going to be beholden to that. So let me just back. Let me just go with what I've written down. So errors on errors on other sheets. So let, let's let's just say it this way: if the error is on the middle sheet, that's pretty easy, right? Because all I have to do is match up the words at the beginning and the end to make sure they're in the right spot, right? But if the what if the error or the mistake is in one of the other sheets? Now I've got to make sure they line up on at least four different what? Four different times if I'm, if I'm adding a cancel sheet, okay? So it's called a cancel sheet because it needs to match up with all the other pages in the choir, okay? Mark 16, the sheet on Mark 16, this sheet right here, this is in the middle of the choir, okay? Numerous, so th there's a couple ways you could do this, right? So does... One, this, the last page ends on this verse because at the top of the next page is going to be Luke 1, verse 50 what? Verse 57, right? This page ends here. This page ends here, right? So at the top of the first, at the first page of the cancel sheet, you're going to have the rest, of, the rest of Mark 54 and then the rest of it so that it fits where it's supposed to fit, right? So that means if I'm the scribe that's adding the cancel sheet, do I have a limited amount of space to work with? Okay, so what people think happened, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna draw it out this way visually. I don't know if this is the best way to do it or not. Okay, 
But let's say I've got Luke uh, 156 here, okay? So that means, and I've got a, and I've got a up here at the end of my cancel sheet. I need to have Mark uh, 14, the rest of verse 54, and so I'm 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 doing all of that right. If I'm going to take out the end of Mark 16, do I have to leave a significant enough amount of space, but still have everything fit the page? Is everybody with that? This is all based upon the science of stick stick stickometry which counts the, spit, the, the height of the letters, the number of characters per column, all of this stuff, and you can count all this stuff out, right? So the idea is that the scribe worked backwards to the beginning of Luke, and then he starts over here and he comes back this way, and then he ends the column right here at Mark what? 16, verse 8, and then you have this blank what? Space. This blank space, okay? So if you have your Bible, look quickly with me. Go to um, Luke chapter 1. So the idea is that he measures out the space for Luke first, okay? And what he ends up doing here is he in the space for Luke, he ends up compressing the letters, So he ends up having more letters per line in Luke, in the Luke section of the cancel sheet, okay? And there are, uh, there are 200 more letters on these pages than there are on the, on the rest of the codex, okay? So what's he doing? He's compressing it in to get it to what? To get it to fit, right? But one of the problems is he realizes that he's compressed it now too much, and now over here he's got too much what? Space. Too much space, okay? So over here, there are fewer letters per line to make, it to make it bigger, to fill the space so that he gets everything to what? Fit and line up where it's supposed to line up in the choir. <clears throat> is everybody with that? Okay, now, there is significant evidence here that this was done in a hurry. Okay, come, over, come with me to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now, is Luke chapter 1, verse 26 part of the cancel sheet? Yep, it fits in the, in the range of verses that would be part of the cancel sheet. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent unto God, unto a city of Galilee, named what? Nazareth. Nazareth. Okay. The scribe made a mistake on verse 26 in Codex Sinaiticus, and it says, In the sixth month the angel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee of Judea. Oh. Or no, wait a minute. J uh, Nazareth, excuse me, of Judea, not Nazareth of Galilee. Okay? Now that is an error of 70 miles difference. In, ge in geographic terms, right? Okay. No other manuscript in the world has this error in this verse. The only one that has this error in this verse is this codex, is this codex right here. Okay. Another example, go to Luke chapter 1, verse 41. Luke chapter 1, verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? At verse 41, Codex Sinaiticus adds some words to the text here. It says, And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb for joy, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. The insertion of the words in Greek for joy is added into that verse at that spot, and no other, no other manuscript in the world makes that insertion. Okay? So what this, is, what this is seemingly demonstrating is that whatever happened here, it was potentially done in a what? In a hurry, and that mistakes were made as it was done. Okay? Now the question then is, well, what in the world is going on here? Okay? What is going on here? Why? Wh wh how could this be the case? Okay? Because, Brad, would you mind shutting that door for me? <clears throat> now, we already know. What are some things we already know? We already know that in 1856, Simonides published The Shepherd of what? Hermes. Hermes. 
We, are, we also already know that that same year, Tischendorf wrote and said that it was a modern what? Modern creation. Everybody remember that? Okay? We know that Tischendorf found the remaining leaves of the Codex in 1859, and we know that in 1860 he wrote and said that, well, her, he, that what Simonides did had to be old because it was where? In there. In there. Okay, so let me just remind you about that. So this is a this is a piece from 1863. It contains in it Tischendorf's statement from 1856. Constantine Tischendorf, 1856. This is him saying that Simonides Hermes is a fake and a modern creation. Okay, then he just then he finds the codex, and this is him in 1860 saying that he was mistaken about this Hermes that Simonides did because he finds what in here? What does he find in this codex? He finds a copy of he finds a copy of the Shepherd of Hermes, right? And so he's got to retract and recant in 1860 what he had previously said in 1856, right? And then he does it again in 1863. We've been over that already. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, good. I don't know. I'm running out of places to put stuff. Okay, so What we're after is trying to figure out what's going on with Mark 16, right? There's only two codexes in the world that don't have verses 9 through 20, and I should probably write that up here, okay? So in both of these, Mark 16, 9 through 20 is what? Missing. Missing, okay? So I found, this is uh, Constantine Tischendorf, an argument by Constantine Tischendorf and a narrative of the discovery of the, scientific, of the Sinaitic manuscript. And this is an English translation from 1866, okay? I found this just this week, and I only printed the portion here that relates to what we are talking about. And there's a couple things that I want to read to you out of this, okay? Um, I just got to find the right spots. So he says, Learned men have again and again attempted to clear the sacred text from these extraneous elements. But we have at last hit upon a better plan even than this, which is to set aside this textus receptus altogether and construct a fresh text. Derived, derived immediately from the most ancient and authoritative sources. So what's he saying? He says we should set aside the text of the Protestant Reformation because we now have better, more ancient what? And what is he referring to primarily? Mostly the one of his precious discovery and the, and the other one that, that is its basically twin sister in, in many respects, right? Now he also says in here, it says a lot of interesting things in here. I'm just giving you some of the highlights, okay? Um, he says that this plan is to, uh, to clear up in this way the history of the sacred text and to recover, if possible, the genuine apostolic text, which is the foundation of our faith. So he is taking the position that what we need to do is recover, reconstruct, and what? Recover the text. Does he take the position that the text was preserved? No. He takes it as his position and his job to reconstruct it based upon new what? New manuscript evidence, okay? May 1843. May 1843. Now remember, 1843 is significant because this is the year Simonides published what? The Epistle of Barnabas. Remember that? In May 1843, Tischendorf is at the Vatican meeting the Pope and looking at Codex Vaticanus, okay? He says, my audience with Pope Gregory, the 16th in May 1843, in my intercourse with Cardinal uh, Massaferetti, uh, and surprising, he, and then he mentions uh, the elaborate linguists and so forth, and he talks about going into Egypt, okay? 
Then he says in relationship to finding the codex, he says, on my return to Saxony, so this would be in 1844, on my return to Saxony there were men of learning who at once appreciated the value of the treasure which I brought back with me. I did not divulge the name of the place where I found it in the hopes of returning and recovering the rest of the manuscript. Why would he do that? So nobody else could get it first. And we already know he goes back again in 1853, gets nothing, and he goes back again in 1859 where he gets the rest of it. Okay? He's got a description of it. Now, this is, this is part of what I want and is relevant, but here's what he says about this. He is given commendations by the Pope and Oxford and Cambridge University for finding the Codex. And he says in here at one point that he would rather have found the Codex than the crown jewels of Great Britain. Okay? But here's what I'm after. 1859. Okay? 1859, he's describing having found the rest of it, and he's got it now in his, in his uh, overnight quarters, for lack of better terms. So let me back up. After having devoted a few days and turning over the manuscript to the... On the afternoon of this day, I was, I was taking a walk with the steward of the convent in the neighborhood, and as we returned towards sunset, he begged me to take some refreshment with him in his cell. Scarcely, now, notice, in his what? Cell. Now, what did we learn last week? So according to Tischendorf, this guy now, in, in 1859, he invites him into his what? Cell for tea. Okay. Scarcely had, they, scarcely had he entered the room when resuming our former subject of conversation, he says, I too have read the Septuagint, i.e. a Greek copy, a Greek translation made by the Seventy. And so saying, he took down from the corner of a room a bulky kind of volume wrapped in a red cloth and laid it before me. I unrolled and discovered to my great surprise not only those very fragments which 15 years before I had taken out of the basket, but also other parts of the Old Testament, the New Testament complete, and the addition of the Epistle of Barnabas and part of the pastor of Hermas. Full of joy, which this time I had, I had self-commanded and concealed from the steward and the rest of the community, I asked, as if, a, as if in a careless way, for permission to take the manuscript to my sleeping chamber to look it over at my leisure. There, there by myself, I could give way to the transport of joy which I felt. So he's like, well, I'm not going to act like I did the first time because when I acted like I did the first time, they locked this thing away and I never saw it again until... I to come back again, right? So I've learned from my first experience and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to bring it back to my room and have a party, okay? I knew I held in my hand the most precious biblical treasure in existence, a document whose age and importance exceeded that of all manuscripts which I had ever examined during, the, during my 20 year study of the subject. I cannot, I cannot now, I confess, recall the emotions I felt in that exciting moment uh, with such a diamond in my possession. Through my lamp dim and the night cold, I sat down at once to transcribe the Epistle of Barnabas. The very first night he's got this thing in his quarters, what does he do? Okay, yeah, but what does he where does he go first? He goes to Barnabas. For two, centuries, for two centuries search has been made in vain for the original Greek of this part of the epistle. He's calling it the original what? Original the original Greek. But what if Simonides already published in 1843? Okay. And yet, this letter from the end of the second down to the beginning of the fourth had, ex had extensive authority since many Christians assigned to it and the pastor of Hermas a place side by side with the inspired writing. So let me ask you a question. Tischendorf, the very night that he gets it, okay, 
What's the first thing he reads? Barnabas. He goes to Barnabas and he no doubt also reads what? Barnabas. Let me ask you a question. How long does it take him to realize he's got a major problem? I don't know the exact time, but his, he already said that Hermas is not old, that Simonides wrote. And what does he find in this thing in 1859? He finds almost an identical copy of Hermas that matched what he already said was a fake in 1856, right? Okay. We already, I already showed you in 1860, does he reverse course? Okay. So who's responsible for this cancel sheet? I'm going to suggest to you that I believe that Tischendorf is, and that he either did it or knows who did it and had it ordered. And the reason for that is the following. Does he have a major problem with the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas? So if he's going to make the argument, oh, I've, let me also say, well, see, I got all this stuff running through my head and I so what I have here this is this is the New Testament in the original Greek this is the Westcott and Hort text but this one is published in 1882 this is the first American printing and it has an introduction by Philip Schaff okay and he says the following about Codex Vaticanus he says it was first printed under the supervision of the celebrated Cardinal Angelo Mai but it was not published until 1857. Now, let me ask you a question. Where was he in 1843? He was at the Vatican. In 1843, does he see Vaticanus under the supervision of Cardinal Mai? In 1857, Cardinal Mai publishes Codex Vaticanus. In 1859, Tischendorf finds Codex Sinaiticus and goes immediately the first night he has it to the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas, right? The very next year, he issues a retraction saying that what he said about Hermas wasn't accurate and that the Hermas, that's, that, that this Hermas, as well as the one found in the Codex, have to be what? Old. Old, right? So, what is one of the quickest ways that he can bring this into agreement with this and thereby close the circle that this is an ancient codex. He can alter Mark's, he can have Mark 16 altered in one of its clearest, most discernible, distinguishable readings. Okay? Philip Schaff says, let me also say this. This is the New Testament Vaticanum. This is the New Testament of Vaticanus, and notice whose name is on that. Right here. Can you read that? Right here. Constantine what? Tischendorf. In 1867, Tischendorf publishes his own copy of what? New Testamentum Vaticanum. Okay? When he finds this thing in 1859, is he already aware of what's in Vaticanus? Yeah. He saw it himself, back, or part of it, back in 1843, and Cardinal Angelo Mai, two years before, had he published a facsimile of the Codex. Does a guy like Tischendorf pay attention to this kind of stuff? Okay? Philip Schaff says, just got to find the right page. He's talking about Sinaiticus, the connection between Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. He says, it often confirms Codex Vaticanus in characteristic readings. And then he lists John 1, 18. He lists Acts 20, verse 28. He lists 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He lists the doxology of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And then he says, the end of Mark 16, 9 through 20. Whoa. Now, who knew he was up a creek and had to alter his course about, about Hermas? 
Who knew what was in Codex Vaticanus? Who calls the world's attention to the fact that there is a cancel sheet in Mark 16? Tischendorf, once in 1844, and a second and a first time in 1867 in New Testament, in uh, Nouveau Testament Vaticanum. Okay? So understand, who's, who's saying, oh, there's a cancel sheet there? Tischendorf. Tischendorf himself is saying there's a cancel sheet there. Stichtometry, James Rendell Harris, 1893. Oh, how much? Okay. Page 72. It is generally held today that Tischendorf was justified in recognizing that the Sinaitic, in the Sinaitic Codex, traces of the same hand that wrote the New Testament in the Codex Vaticanus. So Tischendorf says that the same hand that wrote sections of this wrote sections of this. Now why would he say that? Because he's trying to, he's trying to make sure these two are what? Linked together. Okay? So it was generally held today that Tischendorf was justified in recognizing the Sinaitic Codex, the traces of the same hand as wrote the New Testament, the New Testament portion of Vaticanus. So he's saying that the same person that wrote the New Testament in Vaticanus wrote sections of Sinaiticus. Is everybody with that? Okay? And this is a most important point, and one that settles. If it be correctly inferred, both the unity of time and the place in the two codices. So he's saying that if, if what Tischendorf said is true, then that means that these things came from the same what? Source. The same source, the same time, the same what? Person. Place, and therefore they are both what? Fake. Old. He didn't, he, Tischendorf didn't say they're fake. He's saying therefore they're both what? Old. Okay. According to Tischendorf, there are in Codex Sinaiticus six cancel leaves of the New Testament which have been rewritten by another hand, the hand namely that transcribed the books of uh, Judith and Maccabees and so on and so forth, right? The apparent evidence, the evidence for this is Tischendorf's eyes and Tischendorf's judgment. So the only reason we should believe any of this is because Tischendorf what? Said so. Now think about this, folks. Before 2009, where, well, before the British Museum bought Codex Sinaiticus in the 1930s, where was Codex Sinaiticus? It was in the middle of St. Petersburg, Russia, in the back of beyond of Europe, where you would take time, money, and a lot of things to go over there and look at it. And the only thing people are using here during the revision are facsimiles. They're not actually using the actual what? They're not actually using the actual codex, right? And so they're judging based upon Tischendorf's judgment that these things have the same source, time, and place, providence, origin. Is everybody with that? I've got to move quick. So, the evidence for this is Tischendorf's eyes and Tischendorf's judgment. The hands are apparently the same, okay? On such a matter, Tischendorf's opinion is of the greatest weight. Now, one of the sections that he says that they, he just so happens to mention as one of these six cancel sheets is our little cancel sheet where? Mark. Mark. Okay. On such a matter, Tischendorf, okay, consequent, consequently, most people, even if they have not seen the Sinaitic Codex, accept his judgment. Then he goes into Mark 16. The interest of question is much, is much intensified by the fact that one of the cancel sheets is that which contains the closing passage of St. Mark, okay? Where Codex Vaticanus and Codex uh, Sinaiticus both show a remarkable omission. The coincidence is a curious one, and many people, naturally enough, refuse to believe that it is accidental. They say we have the scribe of B twice over for the remission. Now here's the thing about Tischendorf. Does he claim that this is a cancel sheet? Yeah. Does he claim that they're written in the same hand? Does he claim that this cancel sheet 
for Mark 16 is written in the same hand that did the entire New Testament Codex Vaticanus? The answer is yes. That's what he said. Has anybody seen Codex Vaticanus? Has anybody seen Codex Sinaiticus? Or are they just taking Tischendorf's word for it? Now, William Cooper, who wrote the Kindle book Forging Codex Sinaiticus, and uh, Dr. David Sorensen, who wrote Neither Oldest or Best, they both say, they both believe Tischendorf. And they say that, well, if he's responsible for the cancel sheet, why would he, why would he tell everybody about it? I'm taking the exact opposite opinion. Why do they say that everything Tischendorf says can't be trusted except in this one case? Now here's my argument. What did he say about Hermas here? When he finds this, the first place he goes the very night he has it is to Barnabas and ultimately no doubt to where? Hermas. Does he have to know that he's got a problem? Does he reverse course here in 1860 on what he said about Hermas here in 1856? Okay, Has he already seen portions of Codex Vaticanus in 1843? And then has he already no doubt looked at the ones Cardinal Mai published in 1857? And so he's got a problem here. So the quickest way to bring, to close the loop on this is to have Mark 16 altered, say it's a cancel sheet, say the same hand did it in Vaticanus, and there and nobody's gonna what? Argue with you. Nobody's gonna argue with it. Okay? And when by the time you get to the revision committee in the 1870s, they are using a copy of Vaticanus and facsimiles of Sinaiticus that are both produced by who? Tischendorf. Now, I I am not necessarily thrilled with the e, the smoothness of this particular lesson, but is everybody at least following what I'm saying here? I submit to you that Tischendorf had Mark 16 canceled and re-rescribed so that it would match the unique reading in Mark 16 that he already knew was where. Because does he already have a problem for arguing the antiquity of the Codex based upon the Shepherd of Hermas and the Epistle of Barnabas? So one of the quickest ways to close that loop is to have that cancel sheet made, make sure these two match in Mark 16, then say that the same hand did this drop cancel sheet that did all of the New Testament in Vaticanus, and thereby creating what appears to be the same source, time and place, providence of origin. In the meantime, has Simonides called into question the Barnab the, the antiquity of the Barnabas and the Hermas that are found in the Codex. And who's the guy that has access to all this stuff? It's Tischendorf. Did the monks at St. Catherine's do it? No. Okay. But those, but those who, ex so I'm reading again from Randall. But those who accept Tischendorf's identification will go a step further and try to assign a common origin. Thus, Dr. Hort says in his introduction that he is inclined to believe that both manuscripts were written in the West, probably at Rome. Have Westcott and Hort ever seen a day in their life the original Vaticanus in the Vatican Library or the one that's in St. Petersburg under the auspices of the Russian government? No. And they are reconstructing the text based upon facsimile reproductions that have ultimately been produced by the same guy. Now that's a lot of information. <laughs> okay? So, yeah, Nate. Well, even with Tischendorf, you know, when he gets it in 1859 and he's looking through it in his quarters, he hasn't seen Codex Vaticanus, the, the original Codex, since 43. No. So how is he making that judgment that this is the same handwriting, even though he, he hasn't seen that for over 10 years, almost 15 years? Right. You know, and he's like, oh, this is the same handwriting I saw 15, 16 years ago. 
That's that is that is so beyond. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I, I it's, it's an excellent point. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. You brought up a good point about the title he got and everything. So maybe explain what this meant economically and positionally to Tishio. Well, I mean, he 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 tells you some of that in. Uh, where, where were the Gospels written? Where he talks about getting commendations from the Pope. Um, in the month of October 1862, I repaired to St. Petersburg to present this edition to their majesties. So that's the, that's the final uh, edition that he prints of Sinaiticus. The emperor who had liberally provided for the cost and who approved uh, the proposal of this superb manuscript appearing uh, in the celebration of the millenary jubilee of the Russian monarchy was, uh, dis has distributed impressions of it throughout the Christian world, which without uh, distinction of creed have expressed their recognition of its value. Even the Pope, in an autographed letter, has sent to the editor congratulations and admiration. So the editor's who? Tischendorf. Okay? It is only a few months ago that the two most celebrated universities of England, Cambridge and Oxford, desired to show me honor by conferring on me their highest academic degrees. I would rather, said an old man himself of the highest distinction for learning, I would rather have discovered the Sinaitic manuscript than the Konar of the Queen of England. That's the crown jewel of the queen. So, did he benefit from all of this? Yeah, absolutely. He did. Okay? So you need to understand that I'm taking a decidedly different interpretation than what some of these authors have. I am not... This is... You know, in... Uh, I know there's a lot of conspiracy theorists and stuff out there and, and, and this kind of thing, but you know, in the in the question of who killed JFK, the official story is that Lee Harvey did it, Lee Harvey Oswald did it and he acted alone. Right? In this whole story, there's a lot of people that want to see Jesuit conspiracies and the Jesuits doing this and forging documents and doing all of this stuff, okay? I'm gonna to say to you and I'm gonna to suggest to you that in the case of Codex Sinaiticus, Tischendorf did it and he acted alone. That to me is the most reasonable, plausible explanation and that he alone is responsible for, a, not he alone, in large part he is responsible for setting up the line of argumentation that Westcott and Hort buy based upon manuscripts that they had never even seen or handled themselves with their own hands. And they are totally trust, trusting the judgment of Tischendorf as the piece from Randall that I just read to you said. Okay? Okay. So, any questions or comments about any of this? I do. I feel like this was very disjointed. Maybe it wasn't as bad as I feel that it was. But um, does anybody have any other things for the good of the order before we have to stop that video? So, I, th there's a couple things I still want to do. I want to talk about some more of the details about Simonides, and then I want to talk to you about what is this? Okay, so what? What is the significant? If, if Simonides really wrote the thing, what? who cares? Why does it matter and how is it a big deal if he was telling the truth? I believe at this point, I'm sure you figured it out, that I do think he was telling the truth. I don't think this thing is old. Okay, now what we're going to talk about next time is, even if I think it's old, even if one were to think it is old, it's certainly not best. It is absolutely certainly not best. There are over 23,000 marginal notes and corrections in Sinaiticus. It is the most corrected Greek manuscript in existence. And yet somehow it's supposed to be one of the what? The best. And the only reason they make that argument is based upon how old they say it was. They say it is. Okay, we got to quit. Appreciate your